In the 1920s, when the world was recovering from World War I and cinema was still in its adolescence, an exciting, highly stylized, romanticized, yet nightmarish mode of film arrived from Germany. One can argue that it rivaled Hollywood and its influence is still felt in the cinema of today. This year will commemorate 100 years since the establishment of the Weimar Republic, and to observe this milestone, I'm going to take a novice's look at Weimar cinema and some films I rather like. Word of warning, these films are approaching 100 years old and have been discussed at length by people that are far more intelligent, analytical and coherent than myself, so to call this series a collection of video essays or a retrospective would probably be insulting to your intelligence, so let's just call this a brief overview or a bunch of stuff about Weimar cinema, starting with The Cabinet of Dr Caligari. Here's a speedy synopsis. Spoiler alert for this 100-year-old film. A mysterious old man finishes his life story to a mysterious young man called Francis. Clearly bored, Francis spots his fiancée, Jane, who blanks him and then starts to tell his own mysterious tale to the old man who has just riveted. A fair arrives in Francis's hometown of Holstenfall, bringing with it Dr. Caligari and his axe, Cesare, the Somnam... 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 Um, a man who has slept for 23 years and can predict the future. The fair coincides with a series of grisly murders, the first being that of a cantankerous town official and the second being Alan, Francis's best friend and potential love rival. This leads Francis to investigate the crimes. The town officials arrest this guy who we might see again in the series, but Francis is convinced Caligari and Cesare are involved. Jane meets Caligari, who then decides to have Cesare kill her for no apparent reason other than he's mad. However, Cesare falls in love with Jane, decides to kidnap her, the townsfolk chase him and he promptly dies. Meanwhile, Francis discovers Dr Caligari is in fact the director of an asylum. Upon investigation, he discovers that the director has become obsessed with an 18th century mystic called Caligari. Gary, who travelled fairs with a somnambulist called Cesare, who he manipulated to murder, and that the director has adopted this persona as his own, ultimately resulting in him being incarcerated in his own asylum. As Francis concludes his tale, we once again see Jane, who now believes she is a queen, and Cesare back from the dead and caressing a flower. Into this confusing scene strolls the director, who Francis lunges at and is subsequently straightjacketed and dragged off to his cell, where the director, or Dr Caligari, informs the audience that it is Francis that is mad, thus informing us we have been told a tale through the eyes of a madman. Or have we? And providing cinema with one of its earliest twist endings. So, before we get into the production of the film, let's first turn back the clock a couple of years. It's 1918. After four years of destruction, the likes of which the world has never seen, the guns fell silent across Europe. World War I had finally ended. Millions of people, both soldiers and civilians, had lost their lives or had become injured, and for those that remained, the impact of the destruction would be felt for years to come. With the eerie silence of the guns, change was in the air, whether people desired it or not. Across Europe, monarchies collapsed. The political map was completely reshaped. The role of women had drastically altered. There had been advances in medicine and new technology. It was inevitable that this social and political revolution would have an impact on the art, especially the burgeoning medium of film. Throughout the Western world, cinema had been temporarily stunted by the war, with the exception of the recently established and rapidly growing Hollywood. With conflict's end, there was a strong desire in many European countries to re-establish their film industries, none more so than in the recently defeated and demoralised Germany. In November 1918, one of the conditions set out by the army was the abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm II, pretty much ending the German Empire and leaving the country without any clear authority. Leader of the Social Democratic Party, Friedrich Ebert, formed a socialist and then an unstable three-party coalition government early in 1919. The country was deflated and ill at ease, to put it mildly. Conservatives were not happy with the abolishment of the monarchy, and growing communist factions demanded that the country should follow Russia's 1917 example. In January 1919, a communist group known as the Spartists attempted to overthrow the new government. However, their attempts were quickly blocked when Ebert asked for assistance from a far-right militia known as the Freikorps. The Spartist leaders were arrested, beaten and laterally murdered. 
Despite colluding with Ebert to thwart the uprising, the Fry Corps were not exactly fans of the newly formed Weimar government. Enraged by the inexplicable German defeat and the armistice, their mood certainly did not improve when the Treaty of Versailles was signed in May 1919. The treaty was deeply unpopular in Germany, with a prevailing sense of humiliation and that the nation's honour had been signed away. Meanwhile, the Fry Corps were involved in various insertions and assassinations, which would eventually lead to their attempt to overthrow the Weimar government in the Cap Putsch of March 1920. As the Weimar ministers fled Berlin, a general strike was organised, which meant supplies quickly ran out for the coup, and the unstable, unpopular Ebert returned to his position. During this dangerous, bleak time, Berliners started to notice mysterious posters appearing around the city, which simply read, Du musst Caligari werden, or You must become Caligari. There was no mention as to what these posters meant, just a hypnotic command in spidery writing with a note giving a date, time and location. This hypnotic and remarkably modern advertising campaign heralded the start of a new, exciting chapter in world cinema, as they were for the premiere of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. In February 1920, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari was released to immediate acclaim. Its striking iconography captured the attention of film audiences and critics alike. Despite the dangerous times, German cinema was about to flourish, partly down to the embargo on American films. Yet this new film with its striking, frantic sets and exaggerated mannerisms was not the typical escapism that Hollywood would serve up in hard times but something that the German audience was meant to examine, internalise. It's interesting that this film, created in terrifying, dangerous times, is often cited as being the first horror film. The fates of cinema and horror seem preordained. With cinema's birth in 1895, the desire to shock and surprise the spectator came naturally. The 19th century audience revelled in the macabre with Jack the Ripper, Phantasmagoria, Grand Guineal Theatre, Penny Dreadfuls, Gothic literature and freak shows. Edison's company certainly created pieces of horror, or rather, the trick film. Initially, Mary Queen of Scots, and even an early, rough adaption of Frankenstein. It was in fairgrounds that many people would first experience what we'd now call horror films, so it seems fitting that the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, whose arrival comes at the end of the first quarter of cinema's first century, predominantly plays out in a fairground. According to Hans Janowicz, much of the story was developed and inspired by his visits to Berlin's Kantastrasse with co-writer Karl Mayer, specifically when they saw a sideshow involving a hypnotised strongman. Another apparent inspiration, according to Janowicz, was a mysterious incident that happened to him in 1913 when he visited an amusement park near Holstenwall, Hamburg and laid eyes upon a beautiful young girl. Immediately transfixed, Janovich claimed to follow the girl and watched her disappear into some bushes, only for a man to emerge from the same bushes moments later. The next day, Janovich discovered the girl had been murdered and felt compelled to go to the funeral, where, amongst the congregation, he saw the same mysterious man. Much of Hans Janowicz's recollection were from an unpublished transcript, Caligari, the story of a famous story, written nearly 20 years later when Janowicz was in exile. In fact, it was this transcript that Siegfried Krocker would mostly use when writing his great thesis, From Caligari to Hitler, in which he hypothesised that the film reflected the attitudes of Germany immediately after World War I, with the fairground representing the chaos of Berlin and Caligari representing authoritative tyranny. However, critics of both Crocker and Janowicz claim they were blighted by hindsight, with Janowicz in particular over-dramatising aspects of the production history. The international prestige that Caligari brought the German film industry resulted in anyone associated with it staking their claims in its creation, and it's hard to decipher truth from myth when discussing how this unique landmark in cinema came into being. Hans Janowicz was born in 1890, growing up in Prague and was successful in his early 20s with a career as a published author, theatre critic and dramaturg. During the war, he volunteered for the Austrian army, but the realities of combat as well as the death of his brother brought about his deep hatred of war. Karl Mayer was born in Graz in 1894. According to Janowicz, Mayer's father had been a successful merchant, 
but impoverished the family through gambling and subsequently committed suicide. Now the family breadwinner, young Mayer travelled to Vienna and managed to find work in theatre, working his way up from actor to dramaturg, writer and designer. Mayer was also a committed pacifist and refused to join up, though a later biographer would state that Mayer couldn't serve because he had bad feet. The ever-exaggerating Yanovich claimed that Mayer feigned insanity to avoid serving in the army and had to convince an army psychiatrist that this was the case. Yanovich would claim that this psychiatrist was a model for Dr. Caligari, saying he represented the authoritative pressure that was brought to bear upon the powerless young man. Through mutual friends, Yanovich met Mayer in 1918, and shortly thereafter, Mayer would introduce Yanovich to actress Gilda Langer. Langer would serve as a model for Jane, as, like Alan and Francis, both writers were in love with her, and it was she that would encourage the pair to write together. Another eerie myth that is reflected in the film is that Gilda and Yanovich visited a fortune teller who predicted that Yanovich would survive the war, but Gilda would prematurely die. This incident worked its way into the script when we see Cesare foretell the death of Alan. The role of Jane was ultimately played by Lil Dagover, and Langer actually did die prematurely not long after the film was released. Over a period of six weeks with the German Revolution happening around them, Yanovich and Mayer wrote their script and they quickly presented it to Erich Palmer, then head of Dekla Bioscope. At this point, stories start to diverge as to how the finished product came into being. Let's first look at the audacious production design. This is what immediately caught the attention of the critic and film goer. This is what still captures an audience's attention. Yanovich claimed the actual architects of Caligari from the conception of the idea to the last line of the shooting script were the two authors and no one else. Even the innovation of having the sets painted on canvas instead of using customary scenery may be found in the directions of the shooting script. However, when a copy of the original script was found decades later, Yanovich's assertions were brought into question on many points. Nowhere in the script did the writers indicate their intentions regarding film design or any other form of mise-en-scene. It's not too surprising that Yanovich may have wanted to take some credit for the film's courageous production design. Even today it's much lauded. When you think about it, the actual story and script isn't really overly extraordinary. In fact, it's been described as pedestrian. However, the look of the film was so distinct, gaining international attention, and when you consider that many major names associated with this film needed to flee Germany and re-establish themselves, taking credit for the film's most memorable and praised aspect is completely understandable. Producer Eric Palmer, who would latterly become the most powerful individual in the German film industry, also would offer an alternative version of how Caligari's expressionist set designs manifested themselves. Palmer claimed that the writers did verbally express their desire for the film to look unique, to go with their experimental script. However, where the writers saw art, Palmer saw a relatively cheap film. The movie was to be filmed at the glass house Lixi Atelier, where a film set still had to be mainly illuminated with sunlight even when artificial light was employed. This was a period when there was severe restrictions on electricity and Caligari was to be shot in winter in a city prone to lengthy periods of overcast. Military searchlights were sometimes utilised for bigger sets, but it was decided that Caligari was to be shot in a limited space. All sets were no bigger than 6 metres by 6 metres. Everything had to be shot indoors. According to Palmer, as electricity was limited, the set designers came to the conclusion that lighting effects could be painted directly onto the set. Palmer didn't think it would work and laterally testified to saying, Look here boys, you're all crazy. It's impossible to put fantastic, unreal flat sets behind real, solid people. He insisted on screen tests, but quickly changed his mind. The infamous production design with its audacious patterns and distorted angles was truly created by... Walter Reimann, Walter Rorig, and head of production designer Hermann Warm, and it is to these three men true praise must be given. 
One of the final survivors of the production, Herman Varn, who was Decla's in-house production designer, offered an alternative story regarding the production design and is actually backed up by contemporary sources that Caligari was not in fact produced by Palmer, but once Decla purchased the script, he passed production duties on to Rudolf Minor, himself an occasional director who had made, amongst other things, the first adaption of Henry the Baskervilles in 1914. Varm stated that he was approached to work in the film by Minar and he never saw Palmer, Janovich or Meyer throughout the film's shooting. He also credits Ryman as the chief proponent of the expressionist style, persuading the rest of the design team, director Robert Vine as well as Minar. In fact, the producer instructed the designers to go as far as they could to push the design to its bizarre limits as he wanted to promote the film as an artistic experiment. The cabinet of Dr. Caligari is still recognising the blueprint for cinematic expressionism and the film that kicked off art house cinema. The expressionist movement had been particularly in vogue in Germany in about 1910 and was thought to have died out by the time war had broken out. It's hard to define expressionism. It had been born out of various art movements from Romanticism to Fauvism, and it was a rejection of materialism, emphasising the grotesque as social critique. While the art form has some curiously morbid undertones, it was generally optimistic and shared a belief that change was coming. It was anti-industrialism, anti-bourgeois, but by World War I, the movement abruptly ended as the desire for change and order left a sour taste in society's mouths after the cataclysmic events of the war. A few filmmakers decided to carry the expressionist flame. Some of these early characters in cinematic expressionism had worked in expressionist theatre. F.W. Morneau, Emile Jannings, Werner Krauss and Conrad Veidt. Paul Wegener, mostly known for his role as the Gollum, was an early actor and film director that understood the visual potential of film and was himself an enthusiastic practitioner of expressionism. Everything depends on the image, where the fantastic world of the past meets the world of today. I realised that photographic technique was going to determine the destiny of cinema. Light and darkness in the cinema play the same role as rhythm and cadence in music. However, the filmmakers of Germany didn't merely want to create a distraction from their harsh realities. They didn't push the false commercial elation that Hollywood is accused of, but displayed a blunt, sinister form of melancholy. German cinema was not for mere amusement, but for an audience to think, to self-examine. If one interprets the film as the descent into madness of an individual fighting an authoritarian, the art design reflects and enhances this unbalanced state. Take the fairground scene, it's frantic and ceaseless, full of images of revolving, spinning, from the carousel to the organ grinder. Like the whole film, the fairground, the town and Caligari's mysterious dwelling, the sets are crammed, almost claustrophobic. In the closing moments, the audience are informed the tale has been told by a madman and many interpretations of the piece read the distorted, abstract mise-en-scene are projections of Francis's mental instability. This analysis would go on to exasperate critic Krakauer, as well as writers Janowicz and Mayer, believing the film was completely misunderstood because of the inclusion of the framing device. The writers immediately disowned the film for concluding that Francis is the patient at the asylum, despite it being considered one of the first great cinematic twists. Janowicz would forever claim the original tale was a revolutionary take of overpowering crooked authority. However, they believe the finished film showed the futility of fighting authority as it is restored, re-establishing itself despite the chaos. There is much debate as to how the famous plot twist came into the final film. The only person that claimed responsibility was, of all people, Fritz Lang. Lang claimed that it was he that introduced Janowicz and Mayer to Palmer and that the writers wanted him to direct the film. In fact, into the 1940s, Janowicz did hope Lang would direct a possible remake of Caligari. However, in 1920, Lang was committed to finishing his serial, The Spiders, but he did claim after reading the script he suggested that the story should be framed, believing, as his biographer said, that this would intensify the terror of the expressionist sequences. Janowicz and Krakauer placed the blame for the flashback on director Robert Weiner, which maybe is the reason why he is often ignored when discussing the film's legacy. Born into a theatrical family in 1873, 
Vina had previously practiced law until he turned his attention to writing scripts and would start film directing in 1912. Throughout the war, his reputation as a film director grew. However, it was the cabinet of Dr. Caligari that would cement his name in German cinema. Though he continued regularly to work after Caligari, his heavily stylized films, Genuine and Raskolnikov, failed to impress. Vina's most successful post Caligari film was a reunion with Conrad Veidt called The Hands of Orlock. Vina was the first major individual of the production to pass away in 1938, which obviously meant he was in no position to defend himself or stake his claim on the success of the film. Most film critics and film historians really seem to dismiss Vina's influence, with critic Kim Newman saying, It's technically not that innovative in the way it's filmed or edited, it's all in the art direction. Vina is not often given the credit he deserves as director. While the famous shot of Cesare opening his eyes does feature in the script, Vina would often simplify but also enhance the suggested shots. The original script calls for the awakening of Cesare to be in close-up and we see him struggling to breathe. Now the final film sees Cesare simply struggle to open his eyes, but when he does, the penetrating gaze terrifies us. It's an image that would remain with us over and over again. The murder of Alan is also clearer on screen. The original script calls for moonlight, but there is no shadow play. Again, I believe this is a construct of Vina's. Under Vina's direction, Cesare is more of a creature to be pitied. He truly is a manipulated sleepwalker. He has no will of his own. He's not the real monster. Vina casts Lil Dagover as Jane after Gilda Lange was rendered unavailable due to either dying or getting married. Lil Dagover was born Marie Antonia Joybert in 1887 in Java, East Indies. Her father was a forestry expert employed by the Dutch government to work in the colonies. At age 10, little Marie returned to Germany to attend boarding school, where she would first develop a love of acting. After completing her education, she started to appear in various theatre productions around Europe and would marry Fritz Daghover, who was several years her senior. Lil met Fritz Lang, who would go on to cast her in Harry Kiri and Dermotod. About the same time she met Lang, she met Robert Vina, who cast her as Jane as soon as he saw Harry Kiri. Lila Dagover would go on to become one of the most prolific actresses of Weimar cinema. She successfully transitioned into talkies, briefly appearing in one Hollywood film, The Woman from Monte Carlo. She returned to Germany and appeared in several films for the Third Reich. Lil was apparently a favourite of Adolf Hitler, dining with him on several occasions, yet she managed to continue acting in Germany after the Second World War due to her proclamations of political neutrality. She was the last member of the production to die in 1980. Hans Henrik von Twardowski played Allen and was born in 1898 in what was Stretton, Germany, now Poland. He got the role of Allen, an idealistic young student, at age just 21 and this would lead him into more supporting roles throughout the Weimar period. However, with the growing popularity of the Nazi party, the gay actor decided to flee to America. Gaining little but regular work in Hollywood, in 1939 he would appear in the then controversial Confessions of a Nazi Spy, along with many other fellow emigres. He would also reunite with Conrad Veidt in Casablanca. He would spend his final years on Broadway and passed away at the age of 60 in 1958. The history of Friedrich Ferrer, who played Francis, is a bit sketchy, but it seems that Ferrer was born Friedrich Weiss in Vienna in 1880. Appearing in films as early as 1911. After working on Dr. Caligari, Ferrer would drift into film directing, most notably Thea von Harbo's The House Without Windows, a lost film which apparently had similar art design to The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. As Ferrer was Jewish, he fled the Nazis with his family, first to Czechoslovakia, then Britain, where he attempted to set up a film company. Here, Ferrer would direct the musical The Robber Symphony, but when both the film and company failed, he relocated to America where he found work as a conductor with the National Symphonic Orchestra, as well as managing grocery stores. After the war, Ferrer returned to Germany, passing away in 1950. 
Both Krauss and Veidt had worked together and had made various appearances on screen for a few years. However, their careers were transformed by the cabinet of Dr Caligari practically overnight. They would work in a few theatre productions together and a total of nine films. Despite this connection, however, their lives would follow very different paths. Werner Krauss was only 35 when he took on the role of Dr Caligari. His respectable reputation on the stage, especially in expression drama meant he was an ideal addition for this piece, yet his name would go on to be marred with controversy. Born in 1884, he initially intended to become a teacher, but was thrown out of teacher training college when he had been spotted performing on a local stage. In 1913, he would go on to work with famed producer Max Reinhardt before serving in the Imperial German Navy. After he was discharged in 1916, Krauss quickly sought out film work, and work came regularly. After the success of Caligari, Krauss became a huge star in Germany. Despite his work and apparent friendships with many Jewish colleagues, House was an open anti-Semite, and when the Nazis came into power, he immediately showed his support by playing the role of Napoleon in a play co-written by Benito Mussolini, and this ultimately led to a friendship with Joseph Goebbels. While many of the cast and crew of Dr Caligari had to flee the Nazis, Krauss's role took on a greater significance in the state. Acting as vice president to the Reichsdemgatter and considered by both Goebbels and Hitler to be a cultural ambassador for Germany. In 1940, he would play six roles in cinema's most obnoxious, notorious anti-Semitic film, Jude Seuss. After the war ended, Krauss, along with many high-profile Nazi artists, was expelled from his home in Austria and underwent denazification. Krauss struggled to get work and when he did, protests would often break out. However, unlike other Third Reich actors like Emil Jannings or Heinrich George, Krauss was to some extent forgiven due to his claims of rehabilitation. He did manage to regain German citizenship in the early 1950s and would turn up at film festivals, cooperated in the academic book The Haunted Screen by Lotta Eisner and would receive the Ifland Ring, which is a ring that has been passed down between actors for 200 years and any actor that receives the ring is deemed the most significant and most worthy actor of German-speaking theatre. Despite these acknowledgements, Krauss would never truly achieve anywhere near the level of success he had previously enjoyed and died in relative obscurity in 1959. Born into a middle-class Berlin family, his father had held ambitions that young Conrad would become a doctor. But not being very academic and shining in school plays, he started to appear in local theatre. Veit met Max Reinhardt, who offered him a position in his theatre school, and he quickly went on to regularly perform in various Reinhardt productions and proved to be a popular draw with the female audience members. When war broke out, Veit was drafted into the army and served on the Eastern Front before his duties were transferred into the theatre, entertaining troops. This experience was a great training opportunity and when the war ended, Conrad immediately returned to the stage and received regular work in film. Janowicz and Mayer originally wanted actor and friend Ernst Joitsch, known for his work in The Golem and later as Baron Kurtz in The Third Man, to play the role of Cesare. By the time Dr Caligari was produced, Veit had 30 films to his credit and had worked with Robert Viner, which may explain why he was approached for the role of Cesare. Veit would laterally say, no matter what roles I play, I can't get Caligari out of my system. Such was the profound impact the film had on the actor and his subsequent career. Lil Dagover would latterly report that Conrad was fully engrossed in the role, terrifying her by creeping around the set. The success of the film resulted in Veidt working around Europe and eventually Hollywood, travelling across the Atlantic and into a contract with Universal Studios, where he would most famously play the role of Gwenplena in Universal's silent horror, The Man Who Laughs, before returning to Germany as the silent era came to a close and the Nazi party were on the rise. Conrad's attitude towards the Nazi party was the polar opposite of Krauss's. His third wife, Lily, was Jewish and Veit was advised to divorce her if he wanted to carry on working within the German film industry. Veit's response to this demand was to write that he also was a Jew and he fled the country to Britain. One of the first films he made when he arrived on British shores was 
another adaption of Jude Seuss, a version that was more faithful to the source material as well as being sympathetic to Jewish people. Veit carved out a fairly impressive career for himself in the UK before travelling to the United States in 1940. He made quite a few films, somewhat ironically playing sadistic Nazis, the most famous of which being this little one. Tragically, he would have a heart attack in Los Angeles and died at the age of 50, leaving a wife and daughter and a substantial amount of his estate to the British government to aid them in the war effort. Despite an impressive career, Veidt would always be remembered for his role as Cesare in The Cabinet of Dr Caligari. One of the criticisms thrown at the film in 1920 was that some of the acting was too naturalistic, which seemed at odds with the stylized sets. In the theatre, expressionistic acting was in deliberate opposition to realism or the methods of Stanislavski. In our eyes, the acting in Caligari and other expressionist films might come across as hammy with its intensity, raw anguish and extreme euphoria, but it was purposefully so. On stage, expressionist actors would move mechanically, form their dialogue in a flat or rapid or jerky tone. Expressionist productions felt realism focused only on the surface detail, while expressionism delved into the inner aspects of the character and ultimately humanity. Characters were symbols and impersonal, often not interacting with one another. This is its intention and it was to get the audience to use their emotions to think, not to sympathise. Now, as Caligari was filmed, many of the acting methods had to be rethought and adapted for the screen. Obviously, dialogue was immediately out the window, and contemporary critics are correct in asserting that certain scenes did contain naturalistic acting, mainly between Jane, Francis and Alan, which I personally think helps the film and almost evokes a great sense of foreboding and taps into Freud's theories of the uncanny. Yet experienced expressionist actors, White and Krauss, very much remain as loyal as possible to the style and scenes pretty much left to their own devices throughout the shoot. Decades later, Krauss would recall that on their first day of shooting, he and White studied the sets, then created their own costumes and makeup to aid them in the development of their characters. Expressionist acting techniques are littered throughout the film. Exaggerated synchronisation, excessive terror, rigid claw-like hands, and performers carefully choreograph movements that are designed to blend in with the scenery. For example, in this famous scene, Cesare literally bends in with a forest of artificial trees. As David Bordwell and Kristen Thompson comment, his body echoes the tilted tree trunks, his arms and hands, their branches and leaves. The Cabinet of Dr Caligari had its world premiere at the Marmor House on the 26th of February 1920. The premiere run featured music specifically compiled by Giuseppe Becci. For a long time, the score was considered lost. However, working with Becci's anthologies, some of the score was reassembled in 2001 and is available to listen to online. According to Palmer, Caligari opened in a Berlin theatre, but the audience demonstrated against it and asked for its money back. So after two performances, the theatre threw it out and I couldn't get another theatre to show the film. Homer asserted that he personally spent his own money and time on a huge publicity campaign as the film was shelved after its disastrous opening, fought to get it screened and just by accident it was once again screened much more successfully at the Mormorhaus, one of the most prestigious theatres in Berlin. There is plenty of evidence suggesting that the film was an immediate success within Germany. The film's initial run lasted for an unprecedented four weeks and was brought back a couple of weeks later, with newspapers declaring that performances were sold out. Also, the Mormor House was one of the most prestigious theatres in Berlin and films were specifically chosen to be shown. There was no such thing as an accident. The film did the rounds in German cinemas for months afterwards. Also, Janovich has a completely different account of the premiere. Of course he does, saying that at the end of the film there was a huge applause and a standing ovation from the audience and that the director, producers, cast and any crew in attendance had, had to take to the stage to acknowledge the applause. The 
only people that were not happy that night were Yanovich and Mayer, who promptly went to the bar and got bitterly drunk. Over a year later, New York would premiere the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, lifting the embargo on German films. The New York premiere took place at the impressive Capitol Cinema at 51st Street and Broadway, run by Samuel F. Rothafel. So a live prologue was added with a character called Cranford, introducing himself as the wide-eyed old man that Francis tells his tale to, and concluding at the end of the film that Francis has recovered and he now lives happily ever after ultimately adding a framing device to the framing device, probably infuriating Yanovich even more. A couple of months later, in May 1921, the film would premiere in Los Angeles, and here there actually were protests, but this was mostly down to an imagined fear that a tsunami of German films were going to sweep across the country and destroy the still young Hollywood. On the whole, critics were positive towards the film. The New York Times wrote... The story is coherent, logical, a genuine and legitimate thriller, and after one has followed it through several scenes, the weird settings seem to be of its substance and no longer call disturbing attention to themselves. In motion picture classics, critic Albert Lewin wrote, The only serious picture exhibited in America so far that has anything like the same degree of the authentic thrills and shock of art. The tale of a madman unfolded through mad scenery by mad characters has greater intrinsic reality than any of our photographic pictures. The cabinet of Dr. Caligari has established beyond a cavil the integrity of the motion picture as an art. Variety described it as a mystery story told in the Poe manner and fairly prods the interest along at a high pace. Exceptional photo plays wrote, the film is a revelation of what the motion picture is capable of as a form of artistic expression. Pauline Kael wrote, The sets are used expressionistically to convey the madman's thoughts, to intensify the character's emotions and to emphasise the meaning of the action. This film is so entrenched in the masterpiece classification that a few cautionary remarks should be added. Lest your initial reaction be disappointment, you may be delighted that the flats express something, because most of the actors don't. You may find that the decor, which is highly experimental in terms of space and distance, but is derivative of stage use of expressionism, is a monotonous zigzag, too many hooks and no fish. Caligari, the most complete essay in the decor of Delirium, is one of the most famous films of all time, and it is considered a radical advance in film technique yet it is rarely imitated. And you'll know why. Roger Ebert placed it on his great movie list, stating, Case can be made that Caligari was the first true horror film. There had been earlier ghost stories and the eerie serial Phantomus, made in 1913-1914, but their characters were inhabiting a recognisable world. Caligari creates a mindscape, a subjective psychological fantasy. In this world, unspeakable horror becomes possible. The San Francisco Examiner critic Thomas Nunnan criticised I do not think the weirdest picture in the world a good one to see. I do not like the picture. I intend to see it a second time, but not for the amusement. I feel that I have been hypnotised by Dr Caligari. In France, there was a little animosity about showing the film, and when it was eventually shown, reviews were met. Jean Cocteau called it the first step towards a grave error which consists of flat photography of eccentric deckers instead of obtaining surprise by means of the camera. Jean Epstein wrote, If you have to say a film has fine deckers, I think it is better not to speak of it at all. The film is bad. The cabinet of Dr Caligari is the prize example of the abuse of decor in cinema. Caligari represents a grave sickness of cinema. However, Abel Gantz stated that the film is superb. What a lesson to all directors. The film would in fact play in one French theatre for seven consecutive years. The legacy of Caligari has filtered its way down through to film and even television today, advancing cinema by creating allegory through its employment of plot, set and theme. The idea that a film could visually represent the feelings of the defeated German people dealing with themes of domination and 
uniformity, reflecting the country's apparent need to follow a dictator. The cabinet of Dr Caligari gave birth to the era of German Expressionism. After Caligari, German filmmakers opted to shoot entirely in studios, creating cityscapes and forests indoors. Art design became extremely important within the industry and Hollywood would take note, tempting many talent over to America. Anton Case wrote, The style of German Expressionism allowed the filmmakers to experiment with filmic technology and special effects and to explore the twisted realm of repressed desires, unconscious fears and deranged fixations. Hollywood's golden age of horror from Universal to Val Luton would borrow liberally from Caligari with its use of exaggerated sets, lighting and even the angry mob. The influence would rage on in the 1940s with film noir, sh with shadows and light creating claustrophobic interiors and threatening exteriors. While they considered the first noir, Stranger on the Third Floor made use of the atmospheric shadows, weird camera angles and like Caligari featured a twist ending. The distorted sonography presented in Caligari would really be as blunt and obvious again, yet this style would be known as Caligariism. And we see them in the early horror and noir. Instead of the painted backdrop of Holston Wall's contorted buildings, cameras would be angled and distorted, thus creating the Dutch or rather Deutsch angle, often to express a character's disorientation. During a stint as an assistant director at the Ufa Babelsberg studio in Berlin. A young Alfred Hitchcock was schooled in expressionism, taking the influence back with him to Britain and laterally Hollywood. Hitchcock would use light and shadow throughout his decades-long career. We see it from 1926's Lodger right up to Psycho. The Salvador Dali design sets in Spellbound clearly echoes Caligari. While making Citizen Kane, Orson Welles apparently ordered a copy of Caligari from the Museum of Modern Art and armed with a film handbook specifically created for him by production assistant Miriam Geiger, the first time film director taught himself filmmaking matching visual vocabulary. The darkness and chaotic distortions can be seen in Citizen Kane with its objective photography and shots sharply focused from foreground to background throughout. Caligari has inspired Lynch, very evidently Tim Burton, and even young 21st century filmmakers. Is The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari my favourite silent film? No, it's not even my favourite German expressionist film, but it lit a fire starting an exciting cinematic trend. And though it's 100 years since its conception and its revolutionary freshness might seem archaic and alienating to a modern audience, it's still a fascinating watch and a, and a film that uncannily lingers with you long after the final iris crows on Werner Krauss. I have heard it called cinema's first masterpiece, but unlike other films with that label, it is hard to credit this film to one person. In the preceding decades, it seems as if everyone wanted sole credit for this film's success. However, subsequent analysis and historical research shows that it truly doesn't take one person or even two to make a masterpiece. This was truly a collaborative effort made by a group of young, idealistic, traumatised artists coming together at a slightly terrifying moment in history and creating art that would continue to haunt their audience as well as generations to come.